Hello and thanks for tuning into the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Chamberlain Osawa, Channel Television here in Abuja. I'm joined by Vincent Makori from Voice of America in Washington. Thanks, I'm Vincent Makori at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Chamberlain Osawa in Abuja brings you that story. The Ogun State government has inaugurated the first phase of a special agro-industrial processing zone at Elishon Ikene local government area, a joint venture between the state and Arise Integrated Industrial Platforms. Now, while acknowledging the initiative as potential for economic growth, the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Ms. Adeniyi Adebayo, said the project will address the challenges of foreign exchange deficits in the country. The project, when completed, is expected to attract more investment opportunities and create about 20,000 direct jobs. Processing zone. The Ogun Agro-Industrial Processing Zone is a joint venture between the Ogun State Government and Arise Integrated Industrial Platforms. The project is an integrated development initiative designed to accommodate production, processing and marketing of selected commodities value chains. The two-pronged event attracted the presence of members of the Federal Executive Council, investors, heads of financial institutions, traditional rulers and other critical stakeholders. This initiative today demonstrates that we are taking ownership of that process and we're going to add value. The Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Adeni Adebayo, while acknowledging the potentials of the project, says it will reduce the pressure on the country's foreign exchange. Nigeria is currently facing challenging times. Increased agro-industrialization is key to improving local food security and reducing the need for importation. It creates jobs and can also generate export revenue. I commend His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Ogun State, Prince Dakwa Biodun, for this pioneering feat that the state has achieved. The project partner commends the foresight and the political will of the Governor to see the project through. This project will have a transformational impact for Ogun State and Nigeria by improving job creation and attracting more FDI into the country. The host, Governor Dakwa Biodun, could not hide his excitement over the development highlighting some of the initiatives and reforms to improve ease of doing business in the state. For agro-processing and allied products comprising of the entire agro-ecosystem that promises to generate over 30,000 direct job opportunities and of course individual prosperity. This will... All right, joining us to discuss this is the Senior Special Assistant to the Governor of Ogun State on Agriculture, Dr. Angel Adelaja Kuye. Glad to have you join us on Africa 54. Thank you for having me, Chamberlain. All right, so this is the very first phase of the project that has been launched. What do we expect next on this overall plan moving forward? Well, this project is a massive project that Ogun State has embarked on. It's a $400 million project and it's projected to produce about 20,000 jobs, direct jobs. That doesn't include the ripple effects that it will have on families, communities and other programs and jobs that will um, be created just by servicing the people who work directly with the um, SAPZ. And it's a project that is not just for the benefit of Iperon Elishan but the entire state as a whole. Um, it fits into our agricultural strategy and the Ogun State Master Plan as well as His Excellency Prince Dr. Dapo Abiodun's Building Our Future Together agenda. And for us, because of this unique investment, um, it's important for us to shed light for people to understand why the SAPZ and what the SAPZ really means for Ogun State, the Southwest, and Nigeria as a whole. The SAPZ, in the way and approach that we've developed it, is something where everybody can benefit. The Agricultural Transformation Centers are in various communities and various hubs. So there you have mechanization services, you have input services, you have extension services, you have all the, the hospitals, schools, and all the things and infrastructure that are needed for rural communities. In addition to that, 
each and every single one of those transformation centers link up to the SAPZ. So they, they have sometimes um, light processing, aggregation, warehouses, and other things, and then they link to the special agro-industrial processing zone. And that agro-industrial processing zone, the whole concept is to be able to provide shared infrastructure for um, companies to be able to come and um, do value addition so that we can benefit from that. And of course, you know that the special agro-processing um, special agro-processing zone is next to the agrocargo airport that we're about to complete before the end of this year. And with the agrocargo airport, the goal for us is to be able to leverage on the airport to be able to generate revenue from exports. We've, we're trying to make sure that there's an enabling environment for businesses to thrive, to be able to have consistent access to their raw materials, for farmers to have direct access to the processors, to streamline that process, to make sure that there's infrastructure, there's electricity, there's good road network, there's um, government processes there within the facility. So you'll see that the Nigerian Customs Services has already invested in the special agro-processing zone, um, and they've, they, they're right. um, building a facility on 100 hectares of land to start. For us, the SAPZ is even starting with 5,400 hectares, but that's in the first phase. It'll still expand maybe another um, 10,000 hectares to be able to accommodate all of the companies that want to come in. So you'll see that there's um, uh, climate controlled um, uh, storage facilities. You'll see that there are processing right. facilities. You'll see that there's some plug and play facilities as well for companies that may not want to put in the infrastructure costs themselves. Some of them can bring in their machines, plug in and start producing right away. Sure sounds like an interesting one there. But to what extent is this going to address food security? So for us, as a state, food security is a major issue, and it's the bedrock for um, our development strategy because without good food, without nutrition, you don't have people who can be active participants in the workforce. And we want to be able to make sure that we're producing enough to feed Nigeria, but we're also generating revenue from um, exportation. And if you look at the majority of Nigerians, about 75% of Nigerians are living in the rural and peri-urban area. Even you look at the unique advantage of Ogun State. Yes, we have urban centers like Ota, um, uh, uh, Isheri, um, Maburu, Ibafo, and other locations. However, we still do have very rural areas. And so we want to make sure that those rural areas have access to amenities so that we can reduce the um, rural urban migration. We want to also make sure that they're able to benefit from the work that they do because they're the ones who are feeding the nation. Mm. Once we can start to invest in agriculture okay. and make sure that we cut down the losses um, that we see and to ensure that yeah. farmers have direct link to their market, farmers are able to make more money, we reduce their um, post-harvest losses, we also improve and give them the mechanization and technologies that they need to increase their yields, we will start to find that there's, it's beneficial for the farmer, it's beneficial for the processor, because the more the farmer makes, the more affordable his prices become. And of course, for the end user, it's also beneficial. Okay, so these SAPZs are government enabled and private sector led. How do you see the private sector being properly integrated into this project? <laughs> private sector is at the core of the design of this project. Of course, this is a public-private partnership with Arise Integrated um, Infrastructure Partners, and it's backed by AFC and Olam. And for us, we had over 365 private sector companies, from off-takers to agro-processors, that wanted to come in as, um, as investment partners and, and key into the zone. And we hope to do that as well under the partnership with the Arise um, Integrated uh, Industrial Partners. Now, how would you suggest we encourage agro-investment further in the country? We have to be doing more projects like what Ogun State is doing with the SAPZ, providing infrastructure, providing security, providing power, ensuring that companies are able to plug and play into the system that is on ground, ensuring that we reduce the amount of expenses that they, that they um, are utilizing to start up their businesses by taking some of those things off their, um, off their plates, especially when it comes to infrastructure that shouldn't be their responsibility. And that's the beauty of the SAPZ. It also means letting us have um, efficiency at the ports, making sure that they benefit from things like our agrocargo airport, and of course the Olokola deep sea port, which we're about to invest in as well. It means that we want to showcase how we can improve the ease of doing business for these companies 
and make sure government processes are fast-tracked. If we're able to do those things, we'll see more companies coming into Nigeria because, after all, Nigeria is one of the biggest markets in Africa. All right, and Dr. Angel Adela Jakuye, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54 and check out our headlines 24-7 on viewafrica.com. After the break, Burkina Faso's count of people displaced by seven years of conflict shows half a million fewer IDPs than aid groups report. Advocacy groups say donations could be affected. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Aid groups say nearly 2 million people in Burkina Faso have been displaced by the seven-year conflict with armed groups linked to Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, more than the government's recent estimate of 1.5 million. Advocacy groups say sticking with the lower number could reduce the amount of aid provided for those in need. Henry Wilkins reports from an informal IDP site in Casimoro, Burkina Faso. In Burkina Faso, informal camps for people fleeing the country's seven-year conflict are an increasingly common sight. Non-profit groups said last month that almost two million people are now displaced in the West African country. Shortly afterward, the military government, which fell in a September 30th coup, put the number of displaced at just 1.5 million. The government said it had removed many names from the IDP register. They say they took out people who were counted twice and those who were so well integrated in host communities they could no longer be seen as displaced. Badejo Sisse fled from the country's north around five years ago. He says he still feels like a displaced person. We have to stay here. If the country returns to peace, we would like to go back home. But our village no longer exists and there are no people there. Large parts of northern Burkina Faso, including his village, have been ravaged by terror groups linked to Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. Aminato Wadrago lives in Wagadougou, but government policy does not recognise displaced people in the capital as eligible for support. To receive it, they must go to official camp far from major cities. Wadrago says she fled her town of Jibo around three months ago, travelling along the road to Wagadougou, which some call the highway of death due to the lack of security. Their convoy was attacked. Our convoy got split up and about 40 people who were towards the rear came under fire. My daughter-in-law was injured. She had to be airlifted to Wagadougou. I won't forget seeing her being thrown across the road by an explosion. Non-profit groups told VOA they're obliged to work with the previous government's assessment of 1.5 million displaced, which donors sometimes use to determine the amount of aid they give for the country. Alexandra Lamarche is with Refugees International, an advocacy group based in Washington, D.C. She questions the old government's decision to deregister so many IDPs. But it raises some pretty significant concerns about whether or not the previous government was beginning to deny the real extent of the crisis, which can have real ramifications on the lives of civilians. Needs are increasing across the board in Burkina Faso. Uh, the humanitarian response plan, which was revised in August, uh, shows that there are now an additional 1.4 million people in the country uh, in need of humanitarian assistance compared to the start of the year. For Sisse, he remains in a kind of limbo. He's not content to live in the camp for the rest of his life, but he has nothing to return to. As Egypt implements sustainable alternatives across industries, some migrants in the country are transforming rooftops into eco-friendly spaces by planting lettuce and selling them to supermarkets in Cairo. Well, this initiative is creating income for their families and making buildings greener. The rooftop farming is part of a project to support migrants and is funded by the International Organization of Migration in collaboration with Shadoff, a local supermarket farming company domiciled in Egypt. According to Shadoof, farming units have been installed on 19 rooftops so far and are now operated by migrants as well as Egyptian families to help them transform neglected spaces into an eco-friendly business. The project is also helping to facilitate the migrants' integration in the community. The first and foremost most important part is actually the income generating activity where they have 
an opportunity to produce something and get some income for themselves. At the same time, it can serve a little bit on the mental health of all the beneficiaries, given that some of the migrant beneficiaries have been through harsh or difficult times, especially in the community. Recipients of the rooftop installations were provided with two weeks of training to learn to operate the hydroponic system. We, will, we intend to scale it up. Then by scaling up, we would like actually to work with the Ministry of Education, for example, and do this uh, rooftop farming on top of schools. The idea is to bring children to understand the principle of farming, the principle of hydroponic farming, the principle of a green economy during the curriculum. COP27, which is being held in Egypt, kicked off on November 6th as the country is implementing sustainable alternatives across industries. Now, rooftops in Egypt, which, according to one migrant, were for clutter, are becoming appealing to the eye. South African surveys indicate graduates and high-income earners facing a faltering economy are increasingly packing their bags and moving overseas. The brain and wealth drains are hitting South Africa's tax coffers, which analysts warn will scupper government plans to distribute more wealth to those economically marginalized. Linda Giftash reports from Johannesburg, South Africa. It's time to go. That's what many skilled South Africans are saying as the country faces a myriad of challenges for high unemployment, rising crime and decaying public services. With a job offer awaiting him in New Zealand, this 28-year-old said it was a no-brainer for him and his wife to pack their bags. Basically, if you're in the middle class, you have enough money to live in your house, move in your car, to your work, come back in your car, to your, to your home, or if you want to go to the mall, in your car to the mall, so you live in this bubble. You don't actually leave your car. You're afraid to walk on the street. Why? In the event that, okay, I might get robbed, I might get kidnapped, my wife might get in trouble. First National Bank economists have said that one in five houses being sold in the country ahead of the coronavirus pandemic were linked to emigration. While the pandemic halted that movement, sales are slowly returning. Another marker is the disappointing results of a tax on the wealthiest earners imposed more than five years ago. We didn't collect as much as we thought we would, right? And the number of people in that tax bracket hasn't grown that much, even with the kind of inflation um, that, um, that, um, that, that we are experiencing. So it does tell you that something really is happening um, in that top bracket. New World Wealth, a South African wealth intelligence firm, issued a report earlier this year on the migration of high net individuals worth over $1 million. Researchers say while outflows can be seen in other emerging markets, it is a concern for South Africa's economy. I think if it's an entrepreneur perhaps, or someone who's uh, looking to set up a, a big business uh, or expand a business and then he's moving, then it's obviously more of an issue. I think high net worths are often the first to move because they have the means to move. Uh, but at the same time, middle class will often follow. The potential loss of tax revenue is concerning as the country explores the creation of a basic income grant to support more people earning low and middle income. About half the country's nearly 60 million people live below the poverty line. Revenue Services Commissioner Edward Kieswetter rejected the issue, telling the local press last month that emigration was having a negligible impact on tax collection. Still, only 9% of the population pays income tax, which accounts for 40% of all tax revenue, according to accounting firm Ernst & Young. And economists warn against raising taxes on that small base. Um, we think that we are, if not at the peak, if not um, at, at an inflection point where if you try to increase taxes, you collect lower and lower revenues. If we are not there already, we are very, very close um, to being there. So it becomes detrimental to increase taxes um, in that environment. So Instead, he says job creation is the best way to increase revenues. More than 33% of South Africans are unemployed and youth are worse affected. Mayette says while many people around him have discussed seeking greener pastures, it's often those younger than him making the leap. The brain drain is a real thing. Um, well, actually, it's funny because my younger brother, he's just, he's just done studying now. All of his friends that are completing their degrees, they all have contracts signed with uh, firms in the UK. So they're all leaving straight out of campus. While the impact of emigration is hard to measure for the country as a whole, the communities they leave behind will feel their absence. Linda Giftash for VOA News, Johannesburg.
A Belgian non-profit company, Apopo, is training rats to locate trapped humans in disaster zones. Well, outfitted with a technology-enabled backpack to provide real-time wireless audiovisual communication from within the debris site. The rats here are, however, not the usual rodents that most people associate with garbage and disease. These ones can live up to 8 to 10 years in captivity, which means that even after training, which can take up to 9 months or to a year, they can still live a long working career ahead of them. Giant rats wearing tiny high-tech backpacks are being trained in Tanzania for search and rescue operations. Belgium-based non-profit company Apopo has already trained rats and dogs to detect landmines as well as sniffing out outbreaks of tuberculosis. But because of their size and agility, rats could also be a valuable tool for existing search and rescue efforts. The rats are just as trainable as dogs. Um, they've got a great sense of smell um, and their small size and natural agility should hopefully make them really good in this scenario where they could squeeze in small spaces and get closer to uh, any victims. However, the rats are not the usual rodents that most people associate with garbage and disease. They are African giant pouched rats that can weigh up to around 1,500 grams. The rats can live to up to 8 to 10 years in captivity which means that even after the training, which can take nine months to a year, um, they still have quite a long working career ahead of them. Training of these rescue rats began in August 2021 at Apopo's Training and Research Centre hosted by the Sukhoi University of Agriculture in Morogoro, Tanzania. The rats were trained to locate humans in a mock disaster zone, such as after an earthquake, and will eventually be outfitted with a technology-enabled backpack to enable real-time wireless audiovisual communication from within the debris site. They are also being trained to pull a micro switch around their necks when a victim has been located. The behavioral research scientists say they plan to move the rats to Turkey for additional training trials with Turkish search and rescue group GEA. And if successful, they could be moved to operational trials in which the rats could be mobilized in response to any natural disaster. Fierce female leads were once uh, rarities in the U.S. action movies. More recently, blockbuster franchises and streaming platforms have placed women at the center of the action, saving the day with their strength and ingenuity. Increasingly, these powerful heroines are ethnically diverse, appealing to wider audiences. Viewers Penelope Polo has more. The Alien film franchise launched in 1979 was revolutionary, casting Sigourney Weaver as Ellen Ripley, who resolutely battles deadly extraterrestrials and a corrupt space corporation. The American Film Institute regards Weaver's role as one of the most significant in cinematic history. Make sure they remember you. More recent female action heroes are almost too numerous to count, from Jennifer Lawrence as Katniss Everdeen in the Hunger Games franchise, to Gal Gadot in Wonder Woman, to Scarlett Johansson as a villain turned superhero in Black Widow. And heroines today are more ethnically diverse. Native American actor Amber Midthunder outwits an alien hunter in the 2022 action film Prey, while Viola Davis leads an African warrior unit to victory in The Woman King. Hollywood's embrace of female action leads is driven by popular demand, says Academy Award-winning film producer Kathy Schulman, who advocates for gender equality in the screen industries. Women are the primary buyers of content. That's film, that's television, that's streaming. And so really what you're doing is asking to make a movie for the majority, not the minority. Meanwhile, films with ethnically diverse casts often draw higher global box receipts, according to UCLA's annual report on diversity in Hollywood. Such portrayals matter to young moviegoers. 11-year-old Sophia Panchal says she and her sister Jasmine especially like the TV action miniseries Miss Marvel, featuring a Pakistani-American teen superhero. Especially if they're female. It makes me feel good inside because I know that, oh, they're acknowledging us. They, they're paying attention to other 
religions and other types of people. The change in Hollywood isn't lost on Sophia's mom. It's a different world from when we were growing up with, when there were very few um, main characters that were female and strong. On screen and off screen, female empowerment are intertwined, according to Viola Davis, who reflected on the progression of her prolific career on the screen. And suddenly I was in a position of making choices, but making powerful choices like the woman king. Mm -hmm. And to have that material come to me because everything in this business is about clout. Penelope Pulu, VOA News, Washington. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Charles Television has our last word. We we'll look forward to bringing you another show next week. Remember, channelcv.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Chamberlain, so thank you for watching. Goodbye.